डॉक्टर सीताकांत शर्मा एम्बेसडर राणा कैन यू कम ऑन द स्टेज सेशन वन नाउ इट्स अ वेरी इंटरेस्टिंग सेशन एंड द थ्री बेस्ट स्पीकर्स दैट वी थॉट ऑन द इश्यूज हैव वेरी काइंडली एग्रीड टू स्पीक Dr. Sita Khan Sharma, may I request you to come in. Oh, sorry, Sita Khan. Good morning and thank you all. Esteemed Chair, respected co-panelists, distinguished uh, guests, ladies and gentlemen, I thank sincerely uh, Senator K for inviting me to be part of this dialogue. And I have been. Uh, Uh, asked to speak on India China and the perception of Asian century is a new cold war at play and i think a lot of already been covered during the inaugural session by his excellency and uh, i'll try my best to put a few more uh, points to ponder <coughs> in fact the the topic seems very straightforward but which is actually not it's very intriguing for the fact that we don't have a clear cut black and white answer and either i will not be able to give any clear cut answer what i'll do is raise few more questions and leave it for you to answer and sometime i'll be very diplomatic sometime i'll be very indirect and i'll try to hide behind the maps and figures and facts uh, at the end probably i'll try to give an alternative perspective uh, which i don't have even um, a clear cut answer <laughs> let me start with the narrative that we are seeing these days the asian century the debate in fact is quite long and we have three uh, paradigms you have when you look at the 21st century is whose century the question the first uh, you know paradigm that we have seen during 70s and 80s particularly the pacific century when japan was almost kind of enjoying the romance with that concept and finally we saw that idea lost its glittering allure because of the economic failure of the asian tigers subsequently we find the paradigm of China century starting from 1990s and by that time it was clear that China rather than pacific area that was catching their attention a global power shift uh, by that time was very clear that uh, uh, not turning towards asia and particularly china <clears throat> and what we see uh, since then that china is trying to keep a very low profile has already been talked about uh, by his excellency in order to peacefully rise and is a reason for china not to bandy about the talk of 21st century being a china century then we come across the asian century and the idea has in fact now gone through a two shifts the first part that some or the other related to the pacific century that is i spoke about earlier 1980s and 90s with the asian miracle and then it was in fact a non starter and then probably what we are going through and debating today is the mark two phase of this asian century debate where we find there is a boom in china a vibrant india and also a resurgence in japan and it is predicted by 2050 the china and maybe india will overtake the us economy in size in effect the combined growth of india and china is the subject matter of the renewed talk of an asian century today Then the question comes: Whose Asian century is it? China's or India's? Which century, which country will dominate the 21st century? And the perception of Asian, Sino-Indian uh, Cold War perhaps lies somewhere in this debate. If it is an Asian century, then who will claim that uh, you know greatness in this part of the world and over the world? There are multiple narratives. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, I'm I'm sorry. Let uh, you know divert the things. There are multiple narratives. In fact, the, uh, on the question which nation will dominate the 21st century, Asian century might actually belong to India. And there are some scholars, Indian scholars particularly, and uh, also some Western scholars, those who are vehemently propagating that. with a bigger deregulated economy uh, with a different political setup india will bring a bigger entrepreneurial grassroots potential which will outdo china 
particularly a few days ago, Samir Saran from Observers Research Foundation put out a, a, a report, a kind of article in Huffington Post, where he says India has a 21st century project. And that involves, and the blueprint involves actually the incumbent government's lot of policies that, uh, in the name of making India, skilling India, digital India, smart cities, and uh, all, all, the, all, the, all the policies of the current government. And he is trying to give an example that how Narendra Modi government visited to China, and while coming back, he also landed in Mongolia and South Korea, which is symbolic and symbolic of the intent of India to break the Chinese stranglehold in the Asian imagination of its future. And then, of course, at the same time, we find many Western scholars and Indian scholars for that matter argue that it is not so much of Asian century as China's. Whereas, the voices from China, though highlight China's growing economic military presence in the 21st century, are hesitant to claim outright Asian century or China century as it conveys a chauvinistic uh, uh, touch. I'm not denying for the fact that there are a couple of Chinese scholars who are vehemently arguing for a China century, but a uh, majority of them are not outrightly claiming the century belong to Asia. Then you come to the counter narrative. And Asian Development Bank 2011 brought out, of course, highlighted about India-China's resurgence and then warned at the same time its sustained progress for another 40 years is far from preordained. Because Asians now faced formidable challenge in their quest for promise of an Asian century. And these include growing military threats in different corners of Asia. You have struggled, and most of the Asian economies are now really struggling to maintain that double-digit growth or try to balance their economy and, and fight slow down. It's not a very good state of affair. Most Asia's developing, developed countries are actually struggling with demography, and what it seems by now, they will soon face unprecedented demographic uh, drop. And that is not, again, uh, a good scenario. Environmental degradation, pollution, water wars, water scarcity, these are all some of the other issues that are going to engulf uh, Asian century as well. Then, 21st century has only just begun. Logically, if you look at we are just in the first quarter of the 21st century, and we do not know what the future 21st century holds for us. Therefore, I would suggest rather we should not hold the breath that it is the 21st century is belong to, belong to Asia. And in a balance, if I argue that yes, there is at least a scenario set today for 21st century. And of course, India and China hold the key to the emerging global political economy. And global balance of power definitely setting to particularly this aspect of the part, this part of the Asian uh, geography. Yes, if there is an Asian century at all, it cannot be defined by China's role alone. Beijing is one, albeit significant, contributor to this phenomenon. And then, within that context, you have two competing narratives. Whether this Asian century will be very cooperative, taking into account India-China good relations, or is it likely to be very competitive and conflictual? And uh, uh, in a very pragmatic way, if you look at then I think no credible Asian century can be envisaged without a cooperative and constructive engagement between India and China. Will it be so? That's the bigger question. Ladies and gentlemen, already his excellence highlighted in the, in the inaugural session of the conflictual situation and which are inherent in the setup itself. Both India and China desire to progressively reshape the regional and international system. And then both are divided by deep differences in the conduct of their political affairs, two political set up altogether, then territorial disputes which is lingering, and then geostrategic rivalry at the region, regional level. The last point is which is more interesting that India's proximity to the United States, and which China thinks that India is a swing state can reconfigure and re-strategize the Asian scenario along with America. Now when I look at Cold War, the terminology itself, we come across this kind of cartoons. And in fact, when you explain what Cold War is all about within the international uh, relations literature, we come across often the words used like superpowers, competition for global domination, in a layman perspective. Now, post Cold War, there are a lot of cartoons available. Is China likely to pose another kind of block along with America on the other side? And in the future, what we are visualizing, we would like to see if 
India and China are likely to dominate the world and how they are going to distribute that power configuration. Ladies and gentlemen, when I go to my classes and I ask the students that would you like to see America, India as a superpower in the future, obviously the answer is very enthusiastically yes. And then the subsequent question that I ask, would you mean by a superpower? Can you explain who is a superpower? Yes, of course, we have two models, America, from the Soviet Union, is a superpower, China is almost there. But to put in a, you know, international relations perspective, the students in this will also give that economic power, technological power, you know, defense and all these, all these. But to my understanding, I think these are all components of the attributes of superpower. And I give an example of Japan. Japan has almost all these attributes, all these elements. But still, Japan, in international Cold War lexicon, is not considered as a superpower. Then my, my question is, what are the attributes of a superpower? Why I'm narrating all this? Because my conclusion is based on the attributes of superpower which both China and India are trying to, are likely to achieve in, in the future. The first attribute to my mind within the international relations perspective, the global presence. A superpower is a power which is globally present in every corner of the world at a given point of time. And we have seen throughout the Cold War how two superpowers were trying to be present and influence the outcome in every corner of the world through military alliances or proxies, uh, uh, you know, defense uh, bases in different parts of the world or through developing their transocean reach capability through missiles or flying capabilities. These were some of the common object, uh, you know, strategies adopted by both the superpowers for enhancing their global presence so that they can be present in every corner of the world at a given point of time to influence the outcome of that area. And now if you apply the same technique to China, is almost following the same pattern, but in a very innovative way that I like to hi highlight at the end. The second attribute, ladies and gentlemen, of a superpower is to insulate your own backyard, but, but interfere in others' backyard. See, ensure that no other superpower is dominating in another backyard. And both the super, superpower have done this way back in the old Cold War. China is almost doing in the same pattern. The third attribute of a superpower to my mind, I think, creation of institutions of global governance. If you look back toward the Cold War, both the superpowers have created institutions like United Nations. Uh, mostly the Western powers are dominating the what is called uh, the Britannic system, IMF, World Bank, through which they try to rule and govern the world. These are the mechanisms available to dominate the world and almost China is following the same pattern that I will highlight. <coughs> China almost following a strategic called strategic access, getting into all the strategic locations of the world through its uh, you know, connectivity corridor projects and whatever other things which I will discuss a little later. China has already set out to build multilateral institutions, maybe alternative platforms to provide uh, like-minded people to govern the world, SEO, AIIB, BRICS, NDB, etc. China is also building an alternative world order to my mind and it's not necessarily a kind of in a conflict, conflictual situation with the American world order which is in war. It's just an alternative parallel world order which we might see in the future to, to really engulf the entire world discourse. China acknowledges India as a formidable power in Asia and expects it to be a part of its effort in crafting an alternative world order. Now consider China's, China's willingness to accommodate India. SEO, AIB, BRICS, Development Bank, which, are, which in fact India proposed it. And then China's willingness at certain point to uh, develop a kind of civil nuclear cooperation after India started dealing with America. China also invite uh, you know, India to join the Belt and Road Initiative. These are some of, to my understanding, are some of the space that China would like to provide to India. Uh, of course, not as a uh, you know, similar platform, as a junior partner. I came across this piece of article in Global Times a few days ago. And quite interesting is not the title, but the cartoon. <coughs> and here China probably is giving a uh, kind of space to India, what I told as a junior partner. But at the same time, or meanwhile, what you see, India is more closer to America. And China perceives India as a linchpin on which the US geostrategic interest in Asia will rise. And that's what one of the source of India-China rivalry to my mind. In China and West. India's every bid for high table at the international level, ladies and gentlemen, has been 
subject to China's abstinency. You talked about Indo-US nuclear deal, initially China was not happy with it. India's specific uh, NSG waiver, India, uh, China objected initially under the pressure of America that it gave way. Um, China has actually protested against presence of ONGC and then India's NSG membership still uh, hostage by China's activities. And the last one, if you see, in China has blocked India's attempt at the UN to ban Jesse Mahmoud's uh, chief, Masood Ajahn. And China checkmates all this, whatever China is doing, it's not that it is afraid of India. Rather, to my mind, China is literally angry is that India is not really fathoming or comprehending uh, China's intention to collaborate and be a part of the alternative world order that China envisages in the future. Of course, I understand China, India has a larger stake in China's rise, but it is integrating itself more with the American scheme of world order, even though USA is still confused to my mind where to place India in its scheme of world order. And that I'd like to explain later on if there is any question about it, what I mean by that. Ladies and gentlemen, we come out a lot of cartoons after the, the Doklam spot like this, which are quite intriguing, and that actually represents what is going on in this part of the world involving India and all other you know, partners who are almost in the other side of, of uh, other side of the, the, the uh, uh, you know, alliances that is taking place in this part of the world. You know, keeping aside all these, you know, the lighter side of the question, what we have seen after Doklam, some of the activities that gives a sense to everyone that India is likely to or ganging up against China. Uh, to you know, give sense of a kind of rivalry uh, with much more intention these days. Can it be called as a Sino-Indian Cold War? Yes, Doklam stand-up stand has opened up the issue. And these are some of the uh, pronouncements from uh, the Chinese side. I hope the Chinese ambassador is not present here. Um, in August 2017, he said, uh, India views China as an obstacle for New Delhi to become the dominant power in South Asia and that is a typical Cold War mentality that it needs to shape for closer Indo-Pacific ties. China cannot be contained. What it seems to me that China very proactively or very promptly uh, put the onus of a probable Cold War on, on India's head. And then he says, world having enough space for both China and India to grow or that their history has seen 99% of convergence, only 1% of divergence. So, so from Chinese perspective, there will be no Cold War at all. If there is, it's India is the, is the responsible. On the other hand, you find there are some other pronouncements from China, which is quite intriguing. Uh, way back in 1938, uh, the, 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 the Chinese map that brought out, which they consider the map of shame, uh, which in fact talks about the Chinese um, in a stronghold way back in, in a broader Asian framework. And this is the map where China uh, probably in the future likely to claim that engulfs the entire Asia and that probably uh, draw India into an intensive fight. One more, you know, the authenticity of this uh, paper can be questioned, but uh, this is an article published by a Chinese scholar in the Chinese language newspaper the title is translated from Chinese to India, Six Wars China is Sure to Fight in the Next 50 Years, in a chronological manner what he has given. The first to unify Taiwan, 20 to 2025, 20, recover various islands of South China Sea, 25 to 30, and then the third one, quite intriguing for India, to recover southern Tibet by 2035-40. And if that is so, uh, His Excellency men mentioned about the India-China border issue, and definitely the time frame puts the possibility of resolution of India-China border question by another two decades at least. The rest of the thing we can keep discussing, let me go to the next. And in the same article the author says, if China uses military force to conquer southern Tibet, it has to bear some losses. In my opinion, the best strategy for China is to incite the disintegration of India by dividing into several countries. India will have to will have no power to cope with China and rest of the things that you can see. Um, of course, it is not uh, sweet to the Chinese friends present here, but this is what one of the uh, article was published. What it seems to me there are some dichotomous situations in China, where the official pronouncement is very good. Uh, the private uh, and the individual capacity, some of the scholars are invoking, kind of provoking India by putting forward their thoughts. What would be uh, the short-term scenario? if we take this uh, background forward. 
Yes, the concurrent rise of China and India represents a geopolitical event, what His Excellency has very clearly mentioned in the morning. The Cold War scenario cannot be, to my mind, extrapolated free to sino indian context. If there will be a Chinese-Indian Cold War, instead of being fought over ideology like the previous one, it will be over connectivity corridors, ladies and gentlemen, in the near term, at least from now to decades. Both the countries are now involved very intensively. First China, now India is telling around that path to build pan-Asian as well as trans-Asian connectivity uh, you know, uh, systems or infrastructure in competition. And India and China, what seems to me, the supply chain and their uh, economic growth do not necessarily converse with each other. Ladies and gentlemen, I am going to flash a few more uh, you know, pictures like this. And my humble submission is that I have not studied in greater detail of this, the economic and geographic angle of it, I have no idea. But like what I am to give an impression that how both China and India are getting into this uh, kind of competition uh, by laying down infrastructure uh, like connectivity corridor projects. Very recently, last week, I think China has brought out its uh, active policy in which they are envisaging a polar silk road. China's regional global presence, if you would like to evaluate, almost 60 to 70 percent of the world population is now connected or touched by the Chinese infrastructure build up. Through connectivity corridor projects, China seeks to redefine and recreate Asia's geography, and China will oppose in the near term and avoid and bypass India's strategic presence in Asia in the short term, not likely to open a uh, direct fight. Why I'm asserting that? I think in last year, um, China had signed a kind of agreement with Thailand to uh, build a new canal, which will be Asia's uh, Swiss Canal, that will reduce or contain its Malacca Strait dilemma, and essentially to avoid India's dominant presence in the Malacca Strait. On the Indian side, we have started a lot of initiatives, at least the conceptual stand. You have the North-South Transport Corridor, uh, Asia-Japan Freedom Corridor very recently floated. Asia-Africa Growth Corridor is a maritime uh, connectivity to, uh, to Pacific through uh, Japanese help. Uh, the trilateral highways in the Myanmar Thailand, which is uh, some of the other uh, are going very slow. Uh, BCIN, and then you have india asian uh, Kalagan Multimodal Transport Corridor. Uh, then Mekong India Economic Corridor. Some of them are in a very nascent stage and uh, not, really, uh, uh, not really on the ground. But what, it, what impression we get that both the countries are somewhere or the other into a connectivity corridor war. And I take the liberty to coin a new terminology, not using the Cold War concept, because I, I think we don't have the academic and the strategic community has no alternative except the use of the word Cold War, post-Cold War, post-post-Cold War. So I'd like to take the opportunity to coin a new phrase, ladies and gentlemen. It's a conquered war at play. And in this phase, China will remain as a friend, enemy, rival, and investor for India. Thank you for your attention. My deep thanks to the organizers for inviting me. My respectful greetings to the high personalities who are present, the general chairing today's session, my co-panelist, friends. A lot of the conversation so far has been about China, what China is doing, what is the, what are the prospects for India-China relations. Uh, perhaps a missing element in this is that we've not really talked about India and about India's responses. So, without any apology, uh, let me uh, focus primarily on what India is doing and ought to do, in my humble view. First of all, a resurgent India demands a foreign policy that is strategic, well-considered, far-sighted, and executed in the most optimal manner. And I would submit that we don't exactly get around to doing this. India used to have a fairly reactive approach to foreign affairs and I don't think we have quite realized 
that if we are, if India is an emerging power, then we have the capacity to shape our future. We are not a passive player in the process. I think this element, uh, so far as I could gather, has been missing in our conversation. So, uh, let me focus on what we can do. First of all, and this is my first big point, that we need a more considered, articulate, understood policy and its execution. We have to think Cortelia. Now, you know, the name of Cortelia is now being evoked quite a lot. It's almost become fashionable. But Cortelia was not simply a set of remedies in the period of India's warring states. Cortelia put forward a fundamental political concept, which very few recognized until it was actually a German scholar, a recent German scholar, who drew this out. And he said, Cortelia is the first author of the philosophy of raison d'etat. That is, the state has its own reason, the state acts for its own logical survival and its growth, without any apology to anyone. For example, a foreign ministry has no natural home constituency. You know, after the Falklands War in, uh, in the British Parliament, uh, there was a member of Parliament who <coughs> said, he said, you know, who does the Foreign Office work for? He said, the Communications Ministry works for the Communications Industry. The uh, Environment Ministry works for the Environment. And the Foreign Office, he said, they work for foreigners. This is the kind of thinking, sadly, that has persisted. So, what we need to do is, a foreign ministry has to craft its stakeholders, identify them, pursue them, work with them, and bring them into the policy formulation process. We have begun to do this, but I would submit we can do much more. Example, before the recent exchanges of visits with Israel, for the first time, the External Affairs Ministry sent a preparatory team a few months earlier, which included the secretaries from several other ministries. The idea was bring them into the process of managing a new relationship with Israel. That is forward thinking. And what does it do? It produces at the end of the day what is a whole of government policy. We don't have that. There are people here who know affairs of the Northeast and Myanmar and Bangladesh very well. We made all kinds of promises to Myanmar about building roads, about executing projects, about the port project, about multimodal transport. Very little has happened. Not because of lack of sincerity, but simply because MEA has no clout to get the other ministries on board in terms of executing projects. And it's a sad story, but it's, it's the truth if we are going to uh, be honest with ourselves. On the plus side, MEA now has a state's division. That is, for the first time, is one of the very few foreign ministries that has a unit that handles outreach to Indian states. Because states are major players as subunits of the country, major players in foreign affairs. But we didn't recognize this. In fact, there was a foreign secretary who said in a speech in Kolkata, MEA's remit ends at India's borders. I would beg to disagree. MEA's remit, any foreign ministry's remit today is a domestic remit. It has to work with domestic actors. It has to craft a foreign policy that is accepted by domestic players. Um, we don't set out strategic objectives. There is a paper, uh, one of my articles that's been circulated, and if anyone is interested, there is more material on this. Why do we need to set out strategic objectives? 
First, of course, it clarifies our thinking. But more than that, those strategic objectives become a framework for action. And the way it works, this is how Canada, UK, Australia, Ireland, New Zealand make it work. And these are published documents. All the other foreign universities have the same kind of documents, but they don't publish them. The published documents show that there are the major strategic objectives. There may be three or four, there may be ten. I think Singapore's strategic objectives, uh, my good friend Ambassador Ong may correct me, uh, are about eight or ten. And it's on their website of the foreign ministry. From that you cascade what we may call uh, the uh, specific goals under each strategic objective. And then you take it to the third level, which is the specific actions to execute these goals. So it is a three-level matrix. That's what most foreign ministries have. Sadly, we don't have it in India. And uh, when I discussed it with former foreign secretaries, they'd say, oh, but we don't need it, because it would bind our hands. I mean, as if we are the only country in the world running a foreign policy. And we now need to work much more with non-state actors. We do this. There is now a rise in a dialogue that started just a few years ago. We now work with think tanks. NEA commissions think tanks to produce papers. But why don't we have a forum, a monthly, once in two months meeting with major think tanks? Why doesn't the Ministry of External Affairs not have a business advisory group on India's economic diplomacy. But we don't do that. Why? I've never understood. My second big point is that in this age of globalized diplomacy, we face concurrent challenges in our neighborhood, in Asia, with major powers, and with distant regions. All this requires a policy which is a seamless whole, which integrates everything clearly. And within this, as so many have said, China is our biggest challenge. Of course it is. But does that mean that we crawl into a hole just because we think that China is a, a threat? We have to find, we have to articulate our own responses. As the previous speaker said, you have a situation of uh, hard competition, potential conflict, and at the inauguration we talked about that. But there are also possibilities for beneficent cooperation. And you know, in this paradoxical world, these, all these exist, coexist at the same time. And that's not rocket science. That's just plain reality. So, when we look at our foreign policy, we look at the implementation of our foreign policy. It's like a glass <coughs> that is half full. So somebody says, hey, we have so much to do which we haven't done. And the optimist says, no, we've done quite well. You know, the glass is half full. It will get fuller. And the housewife will say, ye glass kis ne rakha tha? So you see, a half full glass evokes different kinds of responses. That was meant to be a joke. Um, but obviously it fell slightly flat. <laughs> anyway, uh, in relation to China, particularly, we have to craft a policy that takes into account not just the state relations, not just the business relations, but also people relations. Tan Sen Sen, who is probably the most distinguished Indian scholar of China that we have, who makes his home in America and is currently in Shanghai, has just published a book, the title of which is India, China and the World. And what he has said over there, and it's a very provocative statement, he says the relationship between the two countries 
has to be rescued from the two governments. Rescued. That is to say, the two governments are not really handling it terribly well. And maybe the people should be more directly involved in that relationship. Please think about it. Because I was very struck by Sri Narayanan's remarks about the former governor, the former national security advisor, a man we all respect very much. He said some very interesting things about how the Chinese look at India as a cultural entity that seems autonomous and pretty self-contained. When I visit China, my friends from the Institute of Chinese Studies go there, we encounter a similar statement. The Chinese ask, why do you not fear from cultural domination by the West? But we don't. We are perfectly happy to mix with everybody, invite films, TV shows, music, but we know that our Indianness is not going to be diminished by this process. But the Chinese really are scared of a cultural threat. Think about it, please. Thucydides' trap. The idea that a rising power and an established power must clash. Here, of course, both are rising powers, except that China has risen faster. It's reached a level that India has not reached. So, India is in a situation of asymmetry. China is roughly five times bigger than India in most of the matrices that we can apply in terms of GDP, in terms of um, foreign exchange reserves, in terms of trade, in terms of capacity to deliver foreign aid to countries, etc., etc. Industrial strength, economic strength, agricultural power, etc. But that doesn't mean that we have to go and curl up in the corner. It simply means that we have to deal with the asymmetry in the world which, which we find. And there, the key element is that it is not just a world composed of China and India. There is Japan, there is South Korea, there is Vietnam, there is Australia, there is ASEAN, a, a cluster of 10 important countries. We have the capacity to work with all of them, but we have to work in a smart fashion. And I'm not sure if we are always doing that. Maybe Ambassador Ron will be kind enough to put aside his diplomatic finesse and tell us plainly what he thinks India should be doing in relation to ASEAN. <coughs> My third big point is that we don't give resources to our Ministry of External Affairs. Many of you are in uniform and some of you who are in civis are also gentlemen who have worn the uniform of India very proudly in the past, starting with the chairman. But have you considered that the external affairs ministry is India's first line of defense? It is a line of defense in a defensive sense, in terms of solving problems, defanging difficult situations. It is also a line of defense in terms of projecting Indian capabilities in the economic area, in the cultural area, in the political area. But we don't give resources to any. I don't know if you followed the statements made by Shashi Tharoor, who is a leader of the opposition actually, who said that MEA needs more resources, but we don't give them. For the equivalent of three Rafael aircraft, the external affairs ministry would have the resources to do the work it needs. And I'll be specific. We don't get the money for giving technical cooperation facilities, technical training facilities in India. So we train about 20,000 people a year. 20,000 training slots are given to MEA every year. China gives 100,000. India has the capacity to give at least 100,000. But the finance ministry says, sorry, no money. Now, that's not the way. You can't run a foreign policy on the cheap. There is something called the Louis 
index of diplomatic strength, L-O-W-Y. It's an Australian think tank. If you search for it, on, if you Google Louis Diplomacy Index, you will see that India is the 12th biggest diplomatic power in the world in terms of our outreach to foreign countries. But in GDP, we are the fifth biggest country. And we keep boasting we are about to become the third biggest. But why the hell do we not give money? Why do, why do we not have a diplomatic structure which can deliver on these kind of expectations? Part of the problem is also that at MEA, we have not built up our diplomatic capacity. This again is, a, is an interesting new concept. Those who are in uniform understand very well what military capability and capacity means. There is a kind of parallel notion of diplomatic capacity. It's not a very popular one. It's not widely used. I'm one of the few uh, stupid chaps who goes around talking about this. But it doesn't get any traction. Why? Part of the reason is that we don't manage our affairs terribly well. At the apex. I don't want to say too much on this in a public forum, but I would say that it is possible for us to manage our diplomatic machinery more efficiently than we do today. We are a small service. People say India has only 770 diplomats. That's really not correct. If you talk of all the people who can work as diplomats, the number is 1,000, maybe 1,100. But China has 7,000. Russia has 6,000. The United States has 13,000. I'm not saying we go to 13,000, but we can't have a diplomatic <laughs> service that is only 40% bigger than Singapore's diplomatic service. And I say this in the presence of Ambassador Ong. Singapore runs one of the most efficient diplomatic machines in the world. We do a pretty good job on the ground, but we can do so much more and so much better. Last of all, we can learn a lot from Japan, from South Korea, from Vietnam, from ASEAN, from Australia. We don't carry out this process of mutual learning between diplomatic systems. I wrote a book on this, but you know, like many books, uh, who buys them and those who buy, do they read them? That's life. So, I will end by saying, the glass used to be half full, now it's a little more than half full. And it is getting fuller, but much too slowly. Let us remember, we are Cortelia's children. Let us live up to the standards of that great political thinker. Thank you. I think it was a fascinating talk, a fascinating uh, tour de force, if you like, of the diplomatic machinery, diplomatic seal, the diplomatic machinery by Ambassador Kishan Rana. And I think we are all, at least I am intensely educated by the exposure to the inner workings of the diplomatic core, the, dipl the foreign ministry. Uh, I wish, I wish I was as well educated on these issues uh, which uh, Ambassador Rana pointed out when I was in service. Uh, one of my complaints is, not complaints, one of my observations is that during service when we need to interact with our diplomats, equivalents, there is almost no contact, which is a very sad thing and I hope, I hope uh, the government of India in its wisdom, and I use the word wisdom within inverted commas, sees this shortcoming. It's all personal. Um, Mr. Salman Haider was a foreign secretary in my time. 
and uh, he was a very nice person personally to get, get along with. I used to play tennis with him, maybe that was the reason. But I interacted with him quite a lot. Uh, I wonder where he is now. He lives in Delhi. Yes, well, there you are. If this is an institutional thing which should be nurtured. Uh, uh, the uh, theme of this particular phase of the discussion is India and China in the Asian century, strategic challenges and responses. That is, strategic challenges, I take it as strategic challenges to India by China and what should our response be? Uh, well, with China, our big neighbor at, and uh, both the speakers have brought out these points very extensively. I'm just repeating what they said. There are three principles to India's response to China's challenge, if you like, and they can be summarized as India has to cooperate in some cases, India has to compete in other cases and in few cases India has to confront. So that is the stage we have, it will be more or less a permanent situation. Cooperate, compete and where necessary maybe in the minimum cases confront which is happening right now at present. Uh, it is actually the India's China relationship is uh, the clash of two philosophies, strategic principles and philosophies. One is China's strategic principle, the current one of one belt, one road, which is traveling from east to west. And India's strategic principle of look east, act east, which is traveling from west to east, and the two are clashing somewhere. And that has given rise to many issues which you see highlighted in the media almost every day. Uh, the points made by both speakers include again and again Doklam. Doklam Plateau just on the other side of which in Sikkim is the area of Dokala, where some of us may have served. Uh, well, it is an indication of this clashes which taking place between Chinese perception of their national interests and India's perception of its national interests. And in that, in this instance, this audience should understand and everybody in India should understand that, and somebody made this point also, some, some public personality made this point also a while ago, that 2018 is not 1962. He meant it, and of course, in a different context, there was some heated discussion going on. But it is a fact. We've traveled a long way since 1962. And I think most of India's issues vis-a-vis -vis China are due to our own diminished self-perception. We are actually bigger than we think we are. We don't, we, we don't seem to, we means India doesn't seem to understand. We the people of India, the government of India, we don't seem to uh, understand or appreciate that we are actually bigger than we are, than we look. We, we are actually bigger than we are. And Doklam, again I come back to that point, is a instance where even by accident, this Doklam incident was India's expression of its self-confidence expressed by a Havildar on one side and maybe a junior officer on the other. This is how policies start off. And I think it has taken a three-striper, as a Havildar, to point out to the government of India that this is not 1962. 
I think this is the right way to go and I think without pushing or creating unnecessary tension, this is the way India should be moving. I think we have got that lesson. So when we say that we still haven't got it, I think subconsciously we have absorbed the fact that this is not 1962. Uh, the water of the Sangpo, the, which starts off in Tibet as you all know, it flows east, then it takes the big bend and comes south. When it enters India, it becomes the Brahmaputra. And the fears have been expressed that at the bend of the Sangpo, uh, the apprehensions have, been, apprehensions have been expressed by India that China may build dams along the Brahmaputra or the Sangpo as it is and divert a portion of the water into northern China. The apprehensions are certainly there, though we have been reassured time and again by the government of China that this is not the case. Whatever uh, barrages or dams which come up in the air photos and satellite photos of the Brahmaputra, they are run of the river schemes. The water comes out, it is put to uh, generation of hydroelectric and then it just flows back into the main uh, mainstream again. Taking China at its word, if, if, if we take China at its word and this is the correct uh, picture being given to us, well, there seems nothing seems to be the matter. Uh, because by the riparian laws, the upper riparian states have got to uh, pay attention to the demands of the lower riparian states and India is not the only lower riparian state, below us is Bangladesh. But, suppose it is true, suppose it is true and water from the Sangpo is being diverted to the plains of northern China, which needs a lot of water. India doesn't really have to worry. Let me tell you that even in that case, India doesn't really have to worry because by the time the Brahmaputra, as it becomes in India, enters the plain of Bengal as the Lohit River, uh, uh, or Assam rather, as the Lohit River. In India, the Brahmaputra, uh, the Brahma, the Sangpo becomes the Lohit and then becomes the Brahmaputra. Right, Johnny? Siam. Siam. Yeah. Not the Lohit, the Siam. Correct. It becomes Brahmaputra after merging with the right. Lohit and uh, the, the It does not uh, really worry us because when it crosses the Himalayan watershed and comes into the place of the gap, there are enough drainage channels or, drain or enough rivers inside India which are where with adequate rainfall, the volume of water coming from the smaller tributaries into the Brahmaputra below the watershed makes up for the amount of water that India will always get. So, even if the Sangpo is drained, uh, there is water being drained off at the Sangpo, I do not think, I do not think India will have need to worry about inadequate water being fed into the plain of Assam. Bangladesh may have to worry. Is India taking out enough water? Is India taking out more than its due share out of the Brahmaputra? Before it enters Bangladesh, but uh, I've been to the Bang I've been to Bangladesh. Many people here have uh, in those days. The Brahmaputra is an ocean. The Brahmaputra is not a river; it's an ocean, upstream particularly. It took us uh, eight hours to cross it in 1971. We went across it on a motorboat. It took us eight hours to cross it. The flooded Brahmaputra. Anyway, that's just a uh, aside. Uh, the other point that was being made out is the damage to India's econo economy caused by what is called dumping of Chinese uh, market items into Indian markets. If that is so, if everything including the images of Lord Ganesh which has been used during the Diwali, they are made in China, 
then whose fault is it that they are finding a place in our market? It's the Indians' fault. It is India's fault. There's no point complaining about it. Trade, as I said, cooperate, confront, sorry, cooperate, compete, confront. India is failing to compete. It is not the fault of China. It is the fault of the greedy and lazy and inefficient Indian economic sector. If you are going to complain that in our Diwali we are using <coughs> uh, Ganeshas made in China, well the fault is yours. The fault is ours actually. So if we have to compete econ in uh, commercially and economically with China by manufacturing, producing goods of equivalent standards cheaper than what China does. Now, of course, uh, the normal, uh, you know, excuse, I will I'll call it an excuse put up in India is that what oh, we know we are not a we are, we are a democratic country, everybody has a right, those people are regimented and you know they are made to work under inhuman, subhuman conditions. Well that again is an excuse. China does what it does. Firstly I do believe, I do believe, I'd like to be proved wrong, but I do believe that the average person from China is harder working than the average person from India. Now you may now that may be a fallacy, but that's what I feel. That's number one. Uh, number two is the Chinese, the, the average uh, uh, Chinese is no more or no less honest than the average Indian. But I still feel that the Indian cuts more corners than the Chinese. It's a comparative statement. You can work it out for yourself. I may be wrong, but that's what I feel. I feel as an Indian that we are... You go into the uh, <coughs> markets in Calcutta, markets in Bombay, markets anywhere. I do not think that when you go into a bazaar in China, you will find what we have over here. But that, that is very subjective. And you can, uh, of course, uh, not agree with it. The Indian Ocean. Much is being made of the Chinese so-called threat in the Indian Ocean. Vis-a-vis -vis China, you must understand that the Indian Ocean, in the Indian Ocean, in the Indian Ocean, India is strategically better placed than China. And why is that? Because one of China's main trade arteries is the artery from China to the oil fields of the Middle East. And the dagger of the Indian Peninsula and the Andaman Islands is a dagger at their throat. So strategically, should push come to shove, at some time in the future, it may never come to that stage. Uh, we don't even need aircraft carriers. Pardon uh, the naval personnel over there, the, the naval officers over there. The peninsula of India is the largest aircraft carrier you could ever have. It's an unsinkable aircraft carrier sitting astride China's lines of, lines of communication between East China Sea, the South China Sea, and the oil wealth of the Middle East. So whether you they have another uh, canal cut through the Christ, Christmas, it's immaterial. The oil reserves of the Middle East can be dominated by the unsinkable aircraft carrier of the Indian Peninsula. <coughs> So, that way, even strategically, India is better placed than China. Uh, there's 
an economic contest between India and China. Make in China, made in China, make in China has overtaken made in India, make in India a long time ago. We are trailing far behind them. The reasons I have mentioned earlier. And unless we get a move on ourselves and take this make in India seriously, we will never overtake China at all until we have a solid manufacturing base in India. Until we have that time comes, we will always be number two. <coughs> so that is something we should really be looking at. When you are talking of China, vis a vis India, please remember that you are not really looking at China alone. You are looking at China in conjunction with Pakistan. You are looking at a sino pak axis right from the beginning. So when we are, though we are discussing uh, India and China in the Asian century, something like that word AFPAC, Afghanistan, Pakistan, you go to reverse it in respect of China also, you have to, you have to uh, manufacture a term for it. Pak Chin, Chin Pak, whatever you like to call it. There is another combination you both have there, China and Pakistan. And uh, it's a brilliant strategy. I cannot imagine any other country having the guts or the nerve to do it. You recognize your enemy's enemy. You recognize your enemy's enemy. And you enter into a strategic alliance with him. I think uh, the term used to be as close as lips and teeth. I think it was uh, one of the Chinese leaders who said that. Possibly Chow and Lai, that the Indian, that the Chinese and the Indian, uh, and the the Chinese and the Pakistani people are as close as lips and the teeth. And that's true. I mean, would you make a strategic alliance with any country and give him your nuclear weapon because he is your country's enemy? and you straight away given a two fronts situation to your major enemy. Brilliant strategy. Uh, I think we are trying to work our way around that. I think that is possibly why China is now uh, expressing some agitation when we are trying to make our own uh, Delhi-Washington axis, uh, Delhi-Japan axis, so we are trying to construct the string of pearls which we keep talking about. We are trying to construct our own necklace of diamonds. That's our strategy. Let's see how it works out. Uh, this integration of India, this is a very uh, interesting uh, aspect that was projected by both the speakers, I think that China understands India's weak points, which we also witness every day in our media, our caste system, our conflicts inside from state, between states, our, uh, our caste conflict, not our caste, well our caste system is bad enough, but caste conflicts, the general, uh, the general environment of turbulence in this country, this, from outside, it's always bubbling. The people of India to the outside world, particularly say China, they look like mobs predominating on every television screen are not people, there are mobs. Every time, everywhere you look there are mobs. There are people fighting on various issues. Everybody is fighting everybody in India. It is something like the word, the term here was uh, the age of the warring states. India also was a conglomeration of warring states. China has got over its era of warring states. India hasn't got. But then China has a basic advantage over India. It is the Han are ethnically one people. India is not ethnically one people. That is our problem. They have one language one script, we don't have these advantages. But we are also a big people 
I like to think we are a great people and I'm sure we can find a way out, out of it. That's what Kautilya said and I think we should read Kautilya time and again. Both the speakers have mentioned it. Kautilya is a scripture we have not read. And I am surprised. Uh, I tried to introduce Kautilya into the staff college in my time. I tried to introduce Kautilya into the National Defence College in my time. The National Defence College, of course, was very clear. It was a tri service institution. They say, oh, army ka hai, nahi, nahi hoga. Right? Yes. <laughs> Achha, anyway. Uh, but staff college, we should be teaching this in our institutions. Is being done now? I'm glad to hear that. I did my best to introduce it into the teaching institution. A very pertinent point was made that foreign policy, and I'd like to include, uh, add to that defense policy, flows from your own domestic policy. Unless you have a strong domestic policy, you will have, you will not have a strong defense policy. You will not have a strong foreign policy. And. Uh, with that, I think I have overshot my allotted time by quite a few minutes. So I will um, thank once again all the speakers for their really, really interesting and I will some call it brilliant presentations. We all stand well educated and uh, we hope to listen to their presentations in future again. Thank you very much.